Hey everyone, it's Rob Stanley with the Ecom Wiz podcast. And today my special guest is Jeff Lieber. He's founder and CEO of Turnkey Product Management. Hey Jeff, thanks for being on the show. I'm excited to be here, honored to be on the show, thank you. Yeah, so we're gonna jump right into this and today we're gonna be talking about how to help Amazon sellers grow their sales like right now with everything going on these crazy times. And the first question I'm gonna just jump right in is, is this a good time to be a seller on Amazon? I mean, I see that pop up on forums. What's your kind of thought on that right now? Yeah, I mean, we're obviously in the midst of the coronavirus. We're recording this May 27th, 2020. And, you know, yeah, it's been a hectic couple months since Corona hit. But the recent data that we've been seeing is that on average, sales on Amazon are up about 35% for third party sellers as a whole. So, you know, this is actually, even though it's been crazy with inventory restrictions and stuff like that, that stuff is starting to settle down. And, you know, sales are at a higher level than they've ever been on Amazon for this time of year. And so I think more, more companies than ever are shifting to Amazon because the retail stores are closed or there are more people are going out of business every day in retail. Um, I think that's not going to be changed anytime soon unless we, you know, really get a vaccine, but that's probably pretty far away. And uh, honestly, I think it'll just change consumer shopping behavior forever. So now is, is a better time than ever to be shopping, you know, to, to be selling on Amazon as, as well as Shopify and your own channels too. But, you know, people, Amazon is, is up and I'm very long on Amazon. Yeah, absolutely. Some of the sellers I've talked to were looking at their data and they were finding that when we were kind of really in the prime of the uh, shelter in place, their eBay sales be only be, uh, their eBay sales were through the roof and their Amazon sales were down. That was only because of the essential items mm. being sold on Amazon. So they were kind of pushing some of the other stuff down. It wasn't that you couldn't buy it, just they were really kind of pushing it down. But now as we're kind of transitioning out of this into other phases of this uh, virus, uh, they're actually seeing the eBay sales to coming back down a little bit and the Amazon shooting back up. So and is that what you're seeing with some of your clients also? Yeah, we saw a quick dip on a lot of our clients, but then now almost all of our client sales are back back up and a lot, some of them are, are actually way up. And even on the advertising side of things, Amazon PPC and DSP, like the returns that we're seeing are really incredible right now. I think maybe a lot of people had kind of pulled back and kind of gotten into really, you know, scared mode. But yeah, I mean, the, the growth that we're seeing is, is incredible right now with a lot of our clients. So. Uh, it's a good time to be selling on Amazon. Yeah, so we're, I mean, we're talking about some of the good things going on, but what about some of the challenges that some of the sellers are facing right now? Yeah, there's a, there's a number of challenges, but you know, there's always challenges to, to deal with. But um, I mean, the big one was with the inventory restrictions, a lot of people that didn't have third party fulfillment set up, like through their own third party warehouse or uh, 3PL, you know, th those are the ones that did get hit. And I think even outside of coronavirus or a pandemic, it's just a good idea to have third-party fulfillment options and inventory storage set up because it also allows you to expand to other channels like eBay or like Groupon or like Walmart or like Shopify. So it just gives you a lot more versatility and it can often even save you costs because the inventory storage fees are typically less at a third-party warehouse than on Amazon. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to, to do that. So that was one big challenge that I think, you know, if I, if I could recommend like now is the time to, to get in, even if you're, you know, you're back to FBA and it looks all good. Well, you know, I think you don't want to repeat history twice, you know, like it, it, I think it always makes sense to have a third party warehouse option. So that's, that's one challenge that people may want to consider dealing with. Yeah, we did see a lot of people kind of scrambling, trying to get their inventory out of uh, Amazon and over to a uh, 3P. And uh, you're right, absolutely correct. Uh, it, now is the time, now that things are kind of coming back to semi back to normal, maybe people should be looking at that just in case there is an issue like this down the road. Uh, what about, you know, have the primary ways that a seller can build trust with its audience changed at all with some of this that's going on? Hmm. Um, I wouldn't say anything super drastically different than before as far as how to build trust. I mean, at the end of the day, especially on Amazon, you want to have amazing customer experience, which will result in amazing customer reviews. And, you know, you live and die by your reviews on Amazon. Um, and so, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's still doing those fundamental things. So to do that, well, the main thing that I see is like having amazing products, high quality, standing behind your products. Um, you want to have amazing customer support, like human touch and great customer experience. 
And I think you should always use you know, awesome software is to help automate things when possible. Yeah. So like your, your guys software feedback Wiz is obviously an awesome software, which can, you know, it's, I like how visual it is. You can see trends of like how the reviews are doing and how seller feedback is doing. So you can get ahead of it. And you know, if stuff starts having issues, you can catch it super fast and adapt to that. So I think if you're doing those, those three things that, you know, you'll be set up for success, you know, even outside of the coronavirus. Yeah, I agree. That that's definitely uh, well said. Now, what about also? Uh, how does customer service and reviews impact Amazon sales, and what can you do about it? What have you seen as far as that? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a direct correlation between the quantity and quality in, of the reviews that you have, and if you if you got really crappy customer service, and you know you're not you know responding to customer complaints or issues or responding to reviews or monitoring those things and getting ahead of it or having an autoresponder in place to help catch those things beforehand, um, you know, you're, you're gonna get those one-star reviews and those are very, very hard to, to remove. And especially if you don't have a lot of reviews, every one of those bad reviews, it can be detrimental and really hurt you. So you gotta get so many more positive reviews at the end of the day. So I think that is, you know, I mean, Amazon itself is a customer centric driven company. And so I think to, to, you know, really succeed on the platform, you want to cater to that as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great information. What makes up or defines a good product for people to sell on Amazon in your opinion? Yeah. So when clients come to us and you know, maybe they've already got one, one or two like pillar great products, but they want to expand beyond that. Um, one thing that we, like if they'll send us a list or ask us to come up with a list of products, we like to look for is the number one seller, like the number one competitor in your niche of that particular product category, let's say it's yoga mats. If, if your number one competitor is say doing over $100,000 a month in sales, then that's sort of our barometer that that's probably worth a, a close look to see if it's if, if you want to source it. because. If that's the if that if the ceiling is below that, let's say it's only fifty thousand dollars a month. This is the number one seller. Well, that's the ceiling. You know that. And so, if you're launching a new product, you're not going to be number one for a while, or maybe ever. And so, you might only be if if you're crushing it, you might be only doing you know ten or twenty grand a month in sales. And so, I, if it were me, if I'm going to do all the effort, take all the risk, and put all the money in, I would I would like the the, the ceiling on the opportunity to be hundreds of thousands of dollars. A month ideally so that's one thing um, and then number two it is getting more competitive than it was you know years ago on Amazon when I started and so you know one thing is, is really trying to design like a custom you know not a custom but design a product that that is innovative in some way that's different not just a copycat off the shelf because it looks like a hot opportunity but really think about you know would you buy this product over your competitors right can you do anything to make it longer lasting, higher quality, um, bigger, smaller. Uh, is there anything you can do to make a better experience and really differentiate? You don't have to do patented products with everything, but if you can, you know, sometimes just putting the patent pending, um, you know, if you can do a patent pending thing on, on a product, you know, you can, you can get a patent pending um, certification for like, I think it's like three or $400 and you can have that for like up to a year. I believe, you know, to test out a new product. So I've done that before that can help boost sales, but you don't have to do that, but it's just, you know, what, how can you make a really, really amazing, awesome product that your customers are going to love? Yeah. And just to mention about the patent pending, just a couple episodes ago, I had Rich Goldstein on. Uh, so if anybody's interested in more information regarding patent pending or intellectual, intellectual property rights, uh, check out that podcast from a couple episodes ago. Uh, yeah. So yeah, they, that's, Really good, and I was thinking when you were talking about the yoga mats. I mean, you, it, you, people might think that's it's just a mat you put on the floor, but there's so much you could do with that. You know, I, and I may not get the wording right, but the antimicrobial, or maybe it's a blend of different fabrics, or heck, that whole company. Uh, what was it? The ones that does the uh, copper in sewn into the product, right? Mm -hmm. That I mean, really, if you look at it, it's basically just a support brace for your knee, but they blended copper into it, right? So you gotta mm -hmm. just kind of do something different or unusual that helps it kind of stand, the product stand out. So so what are what are you finding that's working right now, uh, you know, that helps your companies grow, the companies you're dealing with grow? 
Yeah, I would say the common separators between the ones that we see do super well and the ones that you know fail or just don't grow would be number one, you want to ideally have multiple products that serve the same customer. So you're building a brand around one customer and that will help you get a higher lifetime value of that customer. So if you're selling a yoga mat for that example, you know what else can you sell to that customer to serve them? Maybe it's yoga blocks, yoga towels. You could sell uh, yoga, yoga, <laughs> yoga, yoga, digital training <laughs> products. You can sell affiliate products, right? And then, so now maybe you're selling a $40 yoga mat originally, but now you could potentially sell $150 of revenue per customer. That gives you a lot more profit to play with that you can now invest into advertising and, and test different mediums to help scale and acquire customers. So that's, that's definitely one of the areas is, you know, um, the, the one product company uh, is a lot is that a disadvantage to those that have, you know, a collection of products to sell? You don't need to have hundreds of SKUs, I'm not saying that, but yeah. even just having a handful of awesome products serving the, the same customer can really make a big difference. Have you dealt with any customers that have done uh, kits where they've taken some of the s similar products that go together and kitted them up and how did that do? Yeah, that's a great way and that's an easy way to add additional variations. Um, so yeah, it, it depends. I mean, sometimes it, it does super well and sometimes it's a marginal increase, um, but it's not that hard to test, right? If you've already got three three products and they, they, they would fit perfectly in a kit, then, you know, it's not too hard to, you know, uh, sell them as, as a kit and test out 50 or 100 units and see how, how that does. So I think that's a great way to, uh, to expand and, and increase your average order value. Have you seen some customers, uh, you know, basically being more successful in certain categories versus others? And do you kind of feel like maybe there is certain categories that on Amazon that have more success versus others, or maybe they're just harder to get into? What's your kind of thought on the whole categories with Amazon and success from them? Yeah, I mean, we've worked with clients in dozens of categories. And, and so I wouldn't say there's, you know, uh, I mean, we, we've seen success in, in lots of different categories. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, like I said, it kind of comes maybe back to that rule of if your number one competitor in that niche is only doing 50 grand a month, that's maybe a really small, too small of a niche category. But I mean, we've seen success in supplements, skincare, you know, health, sporting goods, uh, coffee, food, you know, beverages. I mean, we've seen, we've all, all those just are some of the ones that come to mind. And, you know, got clients doing, yeah, 300, 400, 500 grand a month wow. in sales on Amazon alone in, in some of those niches. So, um, so yeah, I, I don't think there's any particular, you know, yes or no, like you've got to sell in this category. Yeah. Um, and also I would say like, if you're going to build a company and a brand, like you're going to be spending a lot of time <laughs> around this. Like it's a, it's a full-time thing, right? And you're going to be doing this for, you know, probably years. So. Also, you want to do something that you're really passionate about and that you really enjoy um, working with and you know, building a community around and connecting with customers. Because, um, you know, if I, I got into, when I originally started, I, I started um, with a pet brand. I didn't have a dog. And I started with, and then I started a baby brand and I didn't have a baby. And <laughs> I didn't really connect with those customers as well. I mean, I love dogs, but, you know, I didn't, didn't uh, didn't have the, the baby thing as much and so because I, I was chasing an opportunity in a niche because I was just early on I didn't really know any better um, so I still did pretty well and was able to sell that business but you know it wasn't as big or I wasn't as passionate about trying to scale it to the moon or anything because I kind of wanted out to be honest yeah. so yeah well we're gonna get into that some more here a little bit later but uh, maybe you know for the newer sellers the people just getting going what is some of the kind of pitfalls or biggest mistakes you see them make uh, early on? Yeah, uh, I mean, if you're especially starting out early on, like you got to have the fundamentals in place. So that starts with a high converting Amazon listing. So having all those pieces in place, like great sales copy, great images, infographics with text overlaid, um, you know, having a high converting listing is really, really important. Uh, getting Amazon brand registry done, um, it's just it's just totally worth it. Um, you know, you got to get a trademark to do that, but again, it's totally worth it if you're protecting your brand and building a business. It's just it's worth uh, you know a few hundred bucks or whatever it is. Um, and yeah, so that those are you got to have those fundamentals in place. So because if you only have a 
3% conversion rate. You can, I can tell you all these different fancy strategies to do like advertising or organic traffic or social media or whatever, but it's, it's not going to work very well. And it's going to be hard to be, you're going to have a low ceiling because you have a 3% conversion rate. So you got to start there first. Some people just overlook that and they're trying to like chase all these shiny objects, but they've got a crappy listing and they haven't put in the time to, you know, it doesn't take that long. You know, so that's where we always start with our clients is, is optimizing that first. So I think you might have answered this question a little bit, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So do you feel like, uh, I, and one of the questions that comes up is with some of the new sellers is they feel like they have to lower their margins to kind of stay competitive or what we kind of refer to as race to the bottom, right? Race to the bottom price. And, uh, you know, do you feel that people have to do that to stay competitive or you kind of already answered it, but there's a lot of other ways they can go, right? Yeah, I, I would never want to be in a race to the bottom. That feels like a race that you're you're gonna lose even if you win. So, um, yeah, I mean it's just it's a risky game pl playing that. So that's where I think we've kind of all the things we've talked about helps you build more of a, a premium brand where you can command prices what, whatever you want to charge because you you have those different differentiators, right? So. Um, and, and when you have multiple products serving a customer and you can build a brand behind it, build an audience and um, do all those things, you can really charge higher prices than your competitors. So, I mean, we had one company called Vitacup Coffee. They came in brand new company, um, you know, just launched. They came to us, they were doing seven grand a month in sales on Amazon. They were selling um, their K-Cup uh, coffee mm -hmm. pods for $2.50 per pod. <laughs> and so, I mean, you could you could go to Starbucks and, and it's only three bucks for a cup of coffee. Yeah. So they were charging almost Starbucks prices per pod and, and they were brand new, right? And then yeah. you got, you're competing against, you know, Costco and Kirkland and Starbucks and, you know, these different ones where they're selling it for, you know, 30 cents, 50 cents a pod. Um, but they they differentiated their product. They added some some ingredients that made it special. They were you know had great images, and we helped optimize it, and we helped them grow to over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a month in sales in less than nine months. Um, and they were selling a premium product, and they never lowered their prices. So they were able. They had a higher budget, took you know a higher cost to acquire a customer because of those higher margins. They could outspend you know, on advertising. So PPC ads was one of the, the best things that we did with them to help them grow because they had more margin to afford to spend on that, to acquire those customers. And they were in the benefit of having a repeat purchase product like coffee. So that's another, I forgot to mention that earlier, but if you have, if you're searching for what brand or product should I do, if, if you can find a repeat purchase product, you know, where, where you're not just buying coffee one time, you know, they might spend, you know, we had customers that spent over, you know, $500 with them in a year. Um, on Amazon because they came back and you know you, you get married to your coffee brand sometimes so absolutely. that's another another uh, just little tidbit yeah absolutely I mean there's vitamins that show up in my house every uh, every 30 days because my wife's on one of those repeats with Amazon so I completely understand that <laughs> I'm not a coffee person but I could see somebody definitely doing that also yeah mm -hmm. so what you know speaking of you know kind of things that are working on the advertising side you know, is PPC the number one thing or is it kind of a collaboration of several things? What have you seen that's working best? Yeah, so Amazon PPC ads is evolving very quickly. They're starting to catch up to, you know, all the different offerings of, of Google. So Amazon PPC on like Seller Central is still the best place to, to start and focus and optimize. And we're, we're seeing great results there. Um, and now they've started, you know, offering things like video ads and retargeting ads to some sellers, not all. So if you have access to that, you should start testing that for sure. Um, but we're actually, you know, we recently uh, earlier this year got access to Amazon DSP advertising platform. So it's a different advertising platform, but it's still through Amazon. Um, and it's called the demand side platform. That's what DSP stands for. Um, but that that platform is is pretty cool. You can do a lot of really advanced like retargeting and, and like have a ton of control and you can do video ads and you can control like I want to target the customers that visited my listing in the last 30 days but didn't purchase and you can run those ads off of Amazon because I you know because you can run those ads on any website that they're on or any app that they're on almost 
Um, so we're seeing a lot of success there. So we're like, we're, we're the ACOSs that we're seeing on the DSP side are between 10 and 20%, sometimes in the first month or two. Um, you know, and that, that translates to about a six to eight X ROI, depending on what language you speak as far as the, the returns. But um, so that's a way, if, you, if you've nailed the PPC ad side, Amazon DSP is really a way to help scale to the next level um, if you're ready to, to do that. Yeah, Jeff, so prior to uh, starting turnkey uh, product management, uh, you obviously said, you already told us you sold on Amazon but kind of tell us a story prior to that. What led you to start selling on Amazon and walk us through that and then the process you went through with selling on Amazon, selling your business and starting uh, Turnkey. Yeah, so I was working a job out of college. It was a great job just doing healthcare consulting um, in San Francisco for about four and a half years. Um, but I always had sort of an entrepreneurial niche, a marketing bug. And so I was always you know researching different businesses to start on the side and you know, none of them ever took off. But then I saw the Amazon opportunity and, and, you know, just started studying that like crazy and then finally invested in my first product. And I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed sometimes. And so I bought a 20 foot container of one SKU. It cost $15,000 for my test order. And uh, that was how I got into the pet products business with one product. And uh, it took me nine months to sell through, <laughs> to sell through that container. Luckily, it sold through. Luckily, they even sent me the product. I thought there was a 50% chance I was just, you know, going to lose my money. Um, so that was how I got started. I jumped all in and just went for it. And then after I sold through that container, I launched a few more products, launched a spin-off baby brand, like I said. And then I quit my job once I could see, like, wow, this is really, really working and starting to take off. And then a couple friends started asking for for help, they had awesome brands that you know they were at Kickstarters or they had Shopify stores, but they were not succeeding on Amazon. So then they asked for some help. So I helped them, and then they said, "Can we just pay you to do it to manage it for us?" So then they did that. They referred a couple of friends, and then all of a sudden I was managing like you know five clients and th two different brand or three different brands at that point, and it was super stressful. And I was like, "Why did I leave my my old nice job where I was working 35 hours a week?" And uh, so that was the turning point. That was a couple of years ago. And I just said, you know, for my lifestyle, I need to focus on one, one thing and which one do I want, which one did I enjoy doing the most? And that was helping other people's brands. I wasn't, I didn't love like dealing with China like late at night and, you know, inventory, uh, you know, all, all the cash flow management of all that. So for me, I, I just wanted to focus on turnkey. So I sold all my stakes out of all those businesses within like a six month period and uh, then really focused on turnkey. And now we've grown a team to over 15 people and I've helped a lot of, a lot of companies grow. That's, that's great. That's really a, a great story. And just to, so everybody knows, just kind of go over what turnkey offers everybody and you know, the different solutions you guys offer for the Amazon sellers uh, as an agency. Yeah, sure. Um, so we have some some different ways to help. I mean, at the end of the day, it all boils down to if you want to grow and scale your sales and profits, like that's what we do. We just have a few different ways of doing that. So we can do it with like fully done for you management where we'll do everything and just help you scale it. Um, we can also just manage your ads and your Amazon DSP ads. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention for Amazon DSP, if you're interested in that, you can go directly to Amazon DSP's website and go with with Amazon and have them do it for you, but they they'll have a thirty five thousand um, dollar minimum test budget that you have to you know sign a contract and give them that money. Um, so if you're a really big company and that's within your wheelhouse, definitely you know you might want to consider that. But you can also find like a self serve self service or a self managed agency that's gone through the training and certification. Um, for Amazon DSP and then they can offer whatever minimum that they want. So like we yeah. went through that whole process and so we're, we've we found that we only need about a thousand bucks as like a test budget to see if it works or not. It works most of the time, sometimes it doesn't. But anyways, so make sure you, 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 know, you either work with a company like, like ours or find someone that you trust on the DSP side before going all in. Uh, that would just be my advice there. Um, but yeah, and then we also have ways to like do it with with your team. So if you've got a team or you know you want to learn it yourself, we can like do do the the steps with you and, and help you implement in sort of a done with you sort of coaching program. Um, so those are the main main ways that uh, that we help companies grow. That's great. And let everybody know how they get a hold of you, Jeff. 
and your company. Yeah, so if you're interested in just seeing if it's a good fit to uh, to grow, if your business is you know kind of in our wheelhouse, we'll take a look and see what you're missing. So we're happy to hop on a call with you. You can just head over to turnkeyproductmanagement.com slash talk, and you can book a call with us. Um, you can also, if you want any free, you know, we got some free resources and strategies and trainings. You can go to turnkeyproductmanagement.com slash resource. And then you can also search for our uh, Facebook group, which is growing really fast and is awesome, called Playbook for Amazon Growth. And that's a Facebook group on Facebook, obviously. So Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be sure to put all those links down in the description. So anybody who's listening, uh, be sure to check down in that description area. And again, uh, Jeff Lieber, founder and CEO of Turnkey Product Management. Thanks for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity and hope that helps some people out there. Thank you. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and for more information, please visit feedbackwiz.com.